we have had in, in the last year, in fact, we have had as uh, speakers uh, people who are uh, poets and critics of uh, literature. We have had playwrights who are also uh, historians of the uh, theater. Uh, we have had political activists who are also political theorists give a talk here. But in all the 15 years that I've been at Stanford, we've had, never had a farmer talk about farming. So today is a rather remarkable beginning where we have someone who is actually, and was actually, uh, from his family, uh, a farmer in Iran, and then went on to become a great scholar of uh, agriculture, talking about agriculture. So he knows both theoretically, mathematically, and practically what of he speaks. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, to have uh, Dr. Meskaran as a part of the Iran Vision 2040, whose project manager is Mr. P Dr. Puya Azadi. Uh, they have really been doing some remarkable work. I strongly urge you to go on our website, go on the Iran uh, Vision 2040, and read the three papers they have already put online. Uh, uh, they speak for themselves in terms of the remarkable quality that uh, they have. Uh, uh, Dr. Mascaran has been here now for, I think, five months. And I'm hopeful that we can convince him to stay another six months here before he goes on to what I'm sure will be a great academic uh, career at some university that is lucky to have him. Uh, he got his PhD in agriculture in Tehran University in 2011. He then went on to Australia. I was reading his uh, official bio, and he's extremely rigorous in all the details, but I found one factual error. Uh, wow. So I'm going to point it out before the end of the introduction so that you can correct it in your future uh, bios. Um, he went to Australia where he worked as a research fellow at the University of Melbourne for six years. He has received numerous awards, the McKenzie Fellowship Award, for example, the Outstanding Young Research, uh, Researcher Prize Award. Uh, he has now joined us uh, at the Iran Vision 2040, where he co-leads the Food and Agriculture Initiative at Stanford. Uh, he, his work is at the interface of agriculture and ecology, as he will be uh, discussing today. He uses a variety of uh, tools, including big data computing and climate and core, uh, crop models, uh, to understand and predict Iran's agricultural ecosystem. Uh, he has published over 60 academic uh, papers, or presented at conferences in the field of agriculture and ecology. The one big uh, error uh, in his bio is that he is, uh, he says, a fan of Barcelona, which is okay, it's a free country, but he says he's also a fan of uh, Abu Muslim Khorasani team. <laughs> and as you know, on the orders of the uh, Mr. Alam al Khoda, they changed the name Abu Muslim Khorasani. They said that's a little too Persian. Uh, they need a new name that has less Persian in it. So please correct it and reflect the correct name of your team. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Milani, for your kind uh, introduction. Well, uh, the, uh, I still use Abu Muslim Khorasan and Meshkiyete. Uh, so it doesn't matter whatever he or others say. It's always Abu Muslim yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, and then thank you everyone uh, for being here. It's a great honor to be here and, and, and to share my, my work with you. Uh, and uh, uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, food and, and water. Uh, it's a crucial, crucial topic uh, because uh, the life of 80 million people back in Iran depends on, on these two resources. Uh, you can see this uh, image. Uh, it was the suggestion of my friend, Puya, who is sitting there. Uh, and and this, this picture nicely represents the, the vision and idea of the uh, people or the government uh, just in the beginning of the uh, uh, revolution. 
uh, let's let's go back to uh, countryside and and villages and uh, definitely uh, the the route to uh, food security go through uh, goes through uh, villages and rollouts and uh, countryside, but unfortunately uh, this road has not been paved uh, properly. Uh, before I talk about Iran, I would like to uh, provide you a very brief uh, background about the uh, world historical trend in, in provision of food and how it compares with population growth. As you can see in this figure, agri agricultural production has more than tripled uh, over the past uh, 50 years, uh, while population has increased uh, only 2.5 fold. So the rate of growth in, in production uh, exceeds that of the human population. Uh, but the question is how, how did we achieve this remarkable increase in, in production? Well, the Green Revolution was the main driving force. Uh, they were able to produce uh, high yield varieties of crops. They, and then uh, they were able to use fertilizers and uh, uh, the rate of fertilizer application increased uh, 60 by six times, six fold. Uh, the, the interesting part is that the land area of agriculture just expanded by 12 percent. And, uh, but irrigated areas uh, doubled, almost doubled. And uh, the other factor was the control of pests and disease in weeds. Uh, but at the cost of using a huge amount of pesticides, almost six times uh, more than before. And uh, the, the population, global population, is expected to reach uh, 9.2 billion in 2050. And uh, so there is a, another push for increasing agricultural uh, production. But this is not going to be the same. Uh, this is not going to be the, the, the same. Uh, we're not going to go through the same path to increase food uh, by applying more herbicide, more pesticide, and fertilizer. And uh, thanks to this increase in, in, in production, food production, the state of food security has largely improved. Uh, uh, food security, uh, as defined by FAO, is, is, uh, is a situation where all people, at all times, they have uh, access to, to food that they, that they need to have a, a healthy uh, life. And uh, in, in 1990, uh, 1990 the, there were about 8% of our uh, population was, was in, in hunger, undernourished, but uh, it has declined to 11% in 2015. And, uh, but still, there are some countries, like mostly in Africa or North, uh, North Korea, Korea, that they have a huge uh, share of uh, hunger uh, in the population. Iran has also uh, improved on provision of food uh, to its uh, population. Uh, during past decade, uh, and uh, stays above the global average. Um, uh, but as you can see in this, in this figure, uh, the, the trend is, is, has gone through several steps. For example, during war between Iran and Iraq, the color intake uh, remained flat before showing another jump uh, in, in about uh, 90, uh, 1990. And then there has been no further improvement in, in calorie intake uh, by Iranian uh, during the past 10, 15 years. And, and, but it doesn't mean that uh, there is no hunger or undernourishment problem in Iran. We're still, uh, there's been a lot of improvement, but, uh, and at the moment it's below 5%, which is well below the global average, which is 11%. But the question is, how, how, how has Iran, how Iran has been uh, able to produce uh, almost enough food for its uh, growing population? I bet uh, you've seen this photo and have expressed also the emotions and feeling. Uh, uh, for, uh, for my non-Persian uh, friends, uh, it, it just means that uh, Shah's gone, the, the, the king of Iran is gone. And uh, 
this photo was uh, as, uh, related to the early time of uh, uh, the, just the beginning of the uh, revolution. And, uh, but there is something very interesting about this newspaper, and I don't know if you've ever noticed. There are two headlines just related to agriculture. Keshal Arzan, Bishtar Bekarand, Vajolay Khuruj Gandom Ra Begirid. Bank Hai Islami Be Keshal Arzan Komak Konand. Oh, sorry for, for Persian, uh, talking Persian, but it means that um, farmers uh, grow more and stop exporting wheat. And the other one is uh, Islamic banks uh, should, should support the farmers. So uh, uh, from the very beginning of the revolution, there was this huge push uh, for uh, uh, becoming a self-sufficient country. And uh, what to me, it's very interesting. It's funny that uh, it's not clear who is saying that. Someone is, should do this, someone. And I don't know who is saying that. But anyway, uh, whoever said that, the people, uh, the audience, they said, La Beg. Yes, we all uh, for it. We all, all for it. And within a single year, just a single year, the area devoted to wheat uh, cultivation increased. 1.4 million hectares were added to the existing wheat croplands in Iran. Just a single year. And after that, uh, there has been uh, huge fluctuations. And, uh, and in uh, 1998, uh, because of a very severe drought, uh, uh, the cultivated area just dropped to the uh, pre-revolution uh, era. Uh, below five uh, million hectares. But where do we stand in terms of self-sufficiency? Self-sufficiency is simply the percent of food uh, consumed, uh, which has been produced domestically. Uh, uh, some countries like Japan, Saudi, and Saudi, they are net importers. They, pr they produce less than 80% of their the food needs. Uh, a country like Iran is almost self-sufficient. It can it, it's now producing uh, about 90% of its, its production, its, its food needs. And uh, some countries like US and Australia, they are net exporters. They, they have surplus and they export. Uh, I should emphasize that self-sufficiency is not equal to food security. For all these three categories that I mentioned, there are countries that uh, can be uh, uh, food insecure. And the, the, the share of uh, hunger and undernourished uh, people is, is uh, above 5% and even above 15%. Uh, uh, I should also mention that uh, all countries, even large export, food exporters that are fully self-sufficient, uh, such as USA, they still import some food. And countries like North Korea, which is a, uh, perhaps the most isolated country in the world, it relies on food imports uh, for, its, uh, for uh, meeting the food needs of its nation. So what really matters is, is food security, not self-sufficiency. As I said, Iran is not totally self-sufficient, uh, and it still relies on imports. As you can see here, although agricultural exports uh, have increased, imports have increased too, uh, but the net trade in agriculture has been negative, has always been negative, and uh, in very recent years it has shown some uh, uh, declining, it's declining, uh, becoming more negative. Uh, uh, in recent years, the, the net, uh, the import is about uh, four or five uh, billion uh, Export is about four or five billion dollars. Why the export is about eight? So the net balance is uh, minus four billion dollars. And uh, agriculture not only provides uh, the uh, food uh, to the nation, ninety percent of the uh, the food de demands. It also forms one of the main pillars of economy in Iran. It uh, contributes to 10% of GDP and uh, provides uh, employment to uh, 
20% of the to and, and contribute 20% to the total employment. About 4 million people are active in the agriculture sector in Iran. In terms of demography and age, uh, this is the age structure of uh, the uh, population of Iran, and the average age of uh, farmers in Iran is about 52, which is, which is good. The U.S. is, is about uh, 58. And uh, as you can see here, uh, total agricultural production in Iran has increased almost linearly and uh, uh, more than uh, four times uh, compared to during the past uh, 40 uh, years. Although in the beginning uh, more lands were allocated to agriculture, but uh, since 1990, uh, all the increase in production can be attributed to improvement in yield, and which is a very good news. Uh, this, seems, this means that uh, uh, we have been able to produce more from the same unit of land. But how did, how did it happen? It came at the cost of a very precious resource, water. This oil-rich country is very poor when it comes to water. Irrigated farming in Iran very rapidly increased after the revolution. In 1980, most of our croplands were rain fed. And now it's, it's the other way around. About 53% is under irrigated conditions, and 47 are just rain fed. The other reason uh, for such a large increase in production is the expansion of forage and vegetable crop. These crops are heavyweight crops. Uh, for example, the average yield of uh, forage corn in Iran under, uh, is, is uh, 46 uh, tons uh, per hectare. And now compare this value with wheat, which is about 3.5 tons per hectare under irrigated conditions. So using production tonnage as, the, as a measure of uh, uh, success in, in agriculture is misleading uh, because there has been a shift in crop pattern and we are, using, we are now growing more heavyweight uh, uh, crops, forage and fodders. And as you can see, the share of vegetables and forage crops was about 5% in 1977, and it's 17% uh, now. About 2 million hectares are now under these very water-demanding, water-intensive crops. They are mainly summer crops, and you need to irrigate them. You cannot grow them rain fed. So, but how do we manage to supply water to these uh, crops? They should be irrigated. Well, dams were built and wells were dug to supply water. Look at this graph, how rapidly increased uh, the number of dams in Iran has just increased. We have 1,330 dams right now, although half of them are operational at the moment. They provide water to 2 million uh, hectares, 1.7 up to 2 million hectares of land. But it's still, these huge number of dams are not sufficient for the thirsty land of Iran. So, over 400,000, and some statistics say 750,000 uh, uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, wells have been dug in Iran. So it means that there is one well per four square kilometers, or one well per 200 people. Now let's look more closely at the uh, or water, bu water budget. Every year we receive about 400 or uh, 415 billion cubic meters of water uh, through precipitation, rainfall, and snow. But because of high temperature, 70% of it evaporates, leaving only 30% for, uh, for use, uh, and 90% of that is used by agriculture. And unfortunately, 60% of 
that 90% comes from groundwater, from wells, which are for saving account, and we should not exhaust them. Even if we assume that the, to the total amount of water that we have, fresh water that we have, is constant and fixed, which is not true, just because of the population growth, the, the, the per capita of fresh water declines, and we have already reached past the threshold. 1,700 is a threshold for having a sustainable life in a country, and it's about one. 1,600 at the moment in Iran. I told you agricultural production has increased, but how do we compare uh, with the global average with the other countries? For all, all major crops in Iran, grown in Iran, the global average is the global average yield is higher. For example, wheat, this uh, strategic crop in Iran, the average yield. Uh, 3%, 40% is less than the global average. But for orchard, orchard fruits, uh, like apples, dates, uh, grapes, and pistachio, we are in a better position, and we are close to the uh, global average. As I mentioned before, uh, irrigation has been one of the most important factors contributing to uh, crop production increase in Iran. And this figure strongly supports this argument. As you can see, irrigated areas in Iran take 53% of the croplands, but 92% of our production comes from this 53. Rain-fed farming, they take 47% of croplands, but they only produce 8%. So if we get rid of 50% of the, of the lands that we, we are growing, uh, which is under, under, under rain-fed uh, cropping, we would only lose 8% of the production. But this is not the case at a global scale. At the moment, about 80% of uh, our food production, uh, croplands are rain fed, but they produce 60% of our food. So they are much more productive than uh, uh, rain fed uh, agriculture in Iran. But, uh, I should also mention that this might not be a fair comparison because uh, most of these countries were uh, with high uh, yield in, in under rain but conditions. They received a quarter of uh, good rain. Could, uh, so it's not completely fair to say that uh, it's all a problem. As I said, agriculture production has increased. But as I showed you in the uh, net trade uh, analysis of the trade and export and import, uh, it has not been able to keep pace with the population growth. And we have a negative uh, trade balance. Population growth was almost 4% uh, in the 1980s, uh, but declined remarkably. Uh, after a decade and no population uh, is projected to reach 90 or up to 92 million uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, now the devoted question is how we are going to feed this population? Do we have enough water and land to support uh, the food needs of this population, this growing population? So it's, it's really important to, to do to have a good and quantitative understanding of the of water and land resources. And to address these crucial questions, uh, we conducted a systematic analysis of uh, land resources and precipitation in Iran. This work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Kaveh Madani from Imperial College of London, uh, Hossein Hashemi, is just sitting there. <laughs> and uh, my friend uh, Puya Azadi, who is also the program manager of uh, Stanford Iran 2040. Our objectives were twofold. The first objective was to quantify the suitability of Iran's land for agriculture. How good are, how good are they? And where are they? And the second objective was to see if there is any chance to 
improve, increase production by, through land expansion, agricultural expansion? Do we have land that can be allocated to agriculture? Or is it possible to redistribute the crop, uh, crops, uh, crop lands to get to improve sustainability and increase food production? Uh, and to address these objectives, uh, we quantify the suitability of uh, lands in Iran uh, based on three major factors, climate, soil, and topography. They are the most important factors affecting the crop, uh, crop growth and so the suitability of land. Now I'm going to give you um, more, uh, provide you more details about the methods. We collated uh, georeference data on uh, 20 factors. These are some example layers that we used, uh, like precipitation, slope, soil pH, organic matter, salinity, and all sort of these uh, um, data that are relevant to agriculture. But before the analysis, we excluded some areas. These are protected areas, uh, natural reserve that they should remain intact, and we cannot uh, grow crops on, on these lands. Um, what in like, uh, inland water bodies, urban areas, and for natural forests and pastures, they were all excluded from the analysis. We then used a series of uh, mathematical functions to convert these uh, raster layers, these environmental factors, to some suitability indices. For example, uh, here, and, and here one means optimal suitability and zero means uh, total unsuitable. For some parameters, like, like precipitation, the higher values are better. So the more rain, so the higher the suitability. For some other factors, like salinity, soil salinity, the lower values are better. So when they are low, they get a better score in terms of suitability. For some other factors, like, like soil pH, there is an optimal range below or above which the suitability of the land decreases. So we converted all these uh, raster layers to suitability, individual suitability maps, and then took the, uh, the mean of all uh, of these values as the, as the final suitability map. Uh, well, uh, and you may ask why minimum? Well, suppose that you have a land uh, which, is, uh, which has a good amount of nitrogen. So there is no limitation for your crop to grow because of nitrogen. But if the, your land has a low amount of phosphorus, the, then the limiting factor is phosphorus. And so the minimum value of that phosphorus is that determines the crop the suitability of your soil. And now let's assume that water is not limiting. And it's, there is no problem with water. What about the soil and topography? As you can see, uh, about 2% of the land, the total country, was uh, uh, classified as excluded area. And you can see dark red and red color dominates the map. These are, the, uh, these are unsuitable or very poor land. And it's about 60% of the country. So even without water limitation, 60% of our country cannot be, you know, you cannot grow uh, plants sustainably. About 40%, the green colors, are uh, good quality lands, but it's only 40% of the country. So in this analysis, we didn't include water, the effect of water, but you know that uh, water is the biggest problem in Iran. Located in one of the, one of the driest regions in the world, mean annual precipitation in Iran is 250 millimeters. It's one third of the global average. Global average is 816 millimeters per year. And if uh, you don't know Stanford here, the average, the annual average is, is 500 millimeters. And you still complain about drought, which is the, the annual, your annual average uh, is, is twice uh, Iran's uh, precipitation. 70% of the country receives precipitation below 250 millimeters. Only 3% near the Caspian Sea on the top, precipitation is 
above 500 millimeters. So, and it is not still the, the whole story, the whole picture. Because it's not only the amount of water that you receive, but also the amount that you lose through evaporation. As I said, because of high temperature, we, uh, we lose a lot of water. Aridity index is simply the ratio of precipitation to potential evaporation or more precisely evaporate transpiration. As you can see, starting from June, more than half the country is in a very dry condition for five consecutive months. This is uh, the uh, late spring uh, and uh, summer. And most of the vegetables are grown at this period and they need irrigation. And that's why it's a big problem. So when we accounted for the effect of precipitation and uh, loss through evaporation, we came up with this map. This map shows the uh, suitability of Iran's land for rain-fed agriculture. Well, 70% can easily be excluded because usually 250 millimeters per year is the, is the threshold for rain fed for most crops. And uh, only 11 person, the red colors that if you can see them, they are suitable for rain fed farming. This map uh, shows the overall suitability without making any assumptions as to whether the cropping system is rain-fed or irrigated. Uh, here, we, uh, the land suitability was positively scaled with the amount of precipitation, so it reflects a more a realistic situation. So the higher the value of precipitation, you get a higher score for land suitability. And to summarize, less than 3% of the country, roughly 4 million hectares, have high quality lands for agriculture. Eight person, about 30 million, have medium quality, and the rest are poor and unsuitable. Now I move to the next objective, uh, which was exploring the possibility of uh, agriculture expansion and also finding uh, whether redistribution of crop lands can improve uh, production in Iran. For this analysis, to be able to do this analysis, we need to have georeference data about the, the location of problems in Iran. What we don't have this data. We don't know. We know, for example, we have six million hectares of uh, wheat in Iran, growing in, in Iran, but we don't know where are they. It's at the it's at the province level. So we came with this idea to take a large number of uh, random image samples from Google Earth, and then look at the, the, whether we, we look at the, um, and count them, and count them for the presence of agriculture in these, uh, in these uh, samples. We watched, uh, well, I should not say that, because Puya watched 15,000 images covering 1.2 million hectares of land to see where are all uh, distribution of croplands within all suitable classes. 15,000 images. He was sitting there for hours and hours just watching. He had Salabat Shomar. Uh, yeah, and just recording, okay, there is a land, there is a cropland, yes. Just, just counting the number of, uh, uh, yeah. Huge effort. Uh, now I'm going to share you, with you uh, some of the photos that uh, we enjoyed uh, watching. I enjoyed watching, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same for. So this is a, a very good uh, lands. You can see they are very green, mostly in the north of Iran and uh, in Kermanshah Kerman and Kurdistan. And now we go to the good class. You see, there is a bit of decline, and uh, you yeah, know, still in good, beautiful. And now we go to medium class. You can see uh, some part of the, the land is not 
on the uh, agricultural use. And now we go to pool. See in the ridge, a growing the ridge of the hills, and nothing here. And I don't know if anything is happening. And now it's, and now we go to very poor. Just a road. Ah, uh, it's a desert. Yeah, just a little bit of cropping and unsuitable. Mostly desert, mountainous, again desert. Someone is doing some, something there. Okay, and here are the results. The, the top two figures shows the old classification uh, and the actual observation. You can see how nicely they match. And the figure below shows the, the changes in proportion of land uh, percentage of the, the, each class of the uh, suitability class, which has been allocated to agriculture. You can see how it's nicely increased with suitability. And as you can see, 100% of all very good lands have already been taken for agriculture. So there is almost nothing left. For the good class, it's above 80% of it has been used. And, uh, but for medium, it's about 60% uh, has been used. And there might be something available, but there are a lot of logistical issues uh, still whether we are able to expand agriculture. But the other interesting part is, is that of the total cropland that we have, 50% of them are situated in very poor or poor or unsuitable uh, areas, which is really bad. And these lands, they are not suitable for cropping. And it is only through heavy irrigation or other, or they just produce very little at a very high cost of just land degradation. So if I want to summarize, on the top of water limitation that everyone knows about it, everyone is talking about, land is also limiting. As I said, 10-11% uh, is just suitable for agriculture. So there is no room for expansion. There's no, it's very unlikely that we can increase food production in Iran through land expansion. And we, we still have a lot of farming on unsuitable lands, which is a very unsustainable way of doing it. Redistribution of croplands may improve, but there are a lot of logistical issues. It's not that easy that you uh, move from poor lands to medium class lands. It's not, it's not logistically uh, doable. And there are other challenges, environmental pressures. Iran is a member of Convention on Biological Diversity. And as a part of this agreement, Iran needs to increase its protection, its protected area from 8%, which is the current one, to uh, 70% by 2020. So it means that they're going to lose more land. Urbanization, cities, cities are expanding. And most of the cities are located near the very fertile lands. So cities are taking and eating lands that can be used for agriculture. Desertification, you know, soil moisture has decreased. And now we have more problem with uh, desertification. And so more land is going to be lost because of desertification. Soil sanitization, more than 25% of soils in Iran are soil affected. We have salinity problem. And it's becoming worse, again, because of depleting or uh, groundwater. Soil erosion. Every year, uh, we lose about 20, 20 tons of uh, soil per hectare, just due to soil erosion. The very precious soil, which takes 500, 700 years to generate one centimeter of it. And we, we lose 20 tons in, in a single year. And climate change. We have had uh, severe droughts, but uh, 
the, the, the effect of climate is not very certain and we're not sure how it's going to affect Iran because different models give different answers. And it's uh, especially hydrogenous and uh, some areas may get more rain and some areas may get them drier. But I can say it's, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, worse rather than better. Our analysis clearly shows that uh, agricultural expansion and uh, it's not going to work. We need to improve uh, crop yields and uh, uh, use uh, sustainable in intensification uh, to overcome uh, the problems. And the first step is to avoid cropping in uh, this unsuitable lands. They are just making, uh, they're just increasing the land de degradation. And the other thing is we should have a paradigm shift. At the moment, we are focusing on the uh, yield per unit of area. While we should focus, but we should focus on drop uh, production per drop or dollar per drop. That's more important. In a drier country like Iran, it's, water is more important. We should improve yield based on the water that we use, not the unit of land. Modernizing agriculture is already clear. Irrigation or irrigation system is very inefficient. 35%. 35% of the water that we apply to the fields are actually used by the plant. The rest are just wasted. Well, not totally wasted, but you are you're pumping them up from down under and just exposing them to the evaporation. And as I said, they, they, grow, they grow vegetables in, out in the field. Vegetables should go to the greenhouse where you can efficiently use the water. Hydroponic, if you hydroponic greenhouses, you can get yields 10 times that you can get in, 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 uh, in the field. And we have, haven't done investment in that area. Rainfed farming. As I said, only 8% of our production comes from rainfed farming. Why? They take 50% of our croplands. So we should invest more in rain, rainfed farming. We should, be, we, should, we should train our farmers to, 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 know, to learn, teach them how to conserve water in, in the soil. And there are methods. And the other thing is crop pattern. As I said, there has been a shift in, in growing more vegetables and, and forest crops. But we are thinking about the water consumption, water use efficiency. To address these uh, topics, uh, now it is Stanford Iran 2040, uh, 2040 project. We are going to uh, evaluate the full potential uh, agricultural production capacity of Iran. Using crop models and very sophisticated crop models, we're going to uh, predict the yield of some 25 major crops in Iran to see uh, what's the potential yield and production of Iran. This is an example of wheat yield. Uh, it just came out very recently, yesterday, very fresh, taza standard that matter. And then, um, because of that, we didn't have time to make it uh, more interesting, and so the color code is not very uh, appropriate. So we're going to produce 25 of this for 25 crops, or 30 maybe, for 10 years of data, and for various irrigation scenarios and rainfed condition to see how we can, uh, not only how we can uh, uh, estimate the potential production capacity of Iran, but also find the, smart, the smartest crop pattern for Iran. Which crops, which combination of crops, if we grow in Iran, would give the highest uh, uh, return in terms of water use? As you can see, the amount of water that uh, the uh, crops uses to give a uh, fixed amount of uh, dry mass as different, different crops. So we need to take account for these, all these differences. And uh, thank you very much for, for being patient. And uh, I should, yeah, before you, I think you should pause for my uh, uh, very dear friend, Puya Azadi, 
who equally or even more than me contributed to these slides. He, he is a, yeah, please, for him. Yeah.